We're still waiting for the mayor of New Bedford, who is almost here. He's on Huntington, and we're kind of bringing him in by radar. So uh, he'll be here any minute, but um, welcome uh, to the open classroom. And for an evening, I think you are going to find incredibly uh, enlightening. You know, as, all, as this class is uh, from the first uh, days in September through here, we've been looking at some of the most critical issues facing cities uh, in the United States, and particularly facing cities here in Massachusetts. Uh, and over and over again, we've come up with issues that are related to labor management relations, public employee unions. Last week, of course, we had Jay Ash, the manager, city manager of uh, the city of, of Chelsea, as well as Mike Widmer, the head of the Mass Taxpayers Foundation. And we had discussions about where is the Commonwealth going and what's the role of organized labor. Tonight, you're going to ha have a chance to hear from both one of the most important labor leaders in the public sector here in Massachusetts, Tom Gosnell, who is the president of the Massachusetts Federation of Teachers. Um, Truth in Advertising, for 11 years I was a member of the other major teachers union here, the uh, Massachusetts Teachers Association, affiliated with the National Education Association, and I was also the randomly selected rank and file member uh, who worked very closely with the president of the NEA for 10 years, traveling in to at least 30 different states. <coughs> Um, but what I want to do before I introduce our two guests is actually read an op-ed that I wrote and appeared in the Boston Globe on July 18th. And because of that op-ed, I actually got to know Tom, as well as uh, uh, a wonderful response to my op-ed by uh, one of our other speakers, Bob McCursey, an old and very dear friend of mine who's been at MIT for many years and is one of the top industrial relations experts in the nation. So let me just to set the stage, uh, read you uh, from this op-ed. It was called A Future for Public Unions, question mark. And I started out by saying, while working my way through college in the 1960s, yes, indeed, I was in college in the 1960s, on a Ford assembly line in Michigan, yes, indeed, I built and planned obsolescence into Ford carburetors for three years, I was a proud member of the UAW. My union had 1.5 million members. Its economic clout helped provide excellent wages and benefits, and it was one of the most respected progressive forces in the nation, fighting for universal health care, civil rights, uh, and workforce training, and fighting against poverty. Its political clout helped build, uh, boost the national minimum wage legislation, not directly benefiting any of its own well-paid members. Today, the UAW has fewer than 465,000 members, and its economic and political power is greatly diminished. Much of its decline is due to extraordinary blunders made by the auto companies that employ its members. Nonetheless, over the past two decades, the union often failed to take action to preserve the industry and therefore its own membership. It failed to press the auto companies to build high quality, innovative cars that could compete with imports. Often, it insisted on job classifications and work rules that undermined efficiency and compromised the industry's competitiveness. The UAW was not alone. Today, less than 14% of U.S. workers are members of unions, down from 35% in 1955. With membership so low, private sector unions have lost much of their power and the nation is losing a major force for progressive change. Will public sector unions follow the same path? <coughs> Nationwide, these unions represent over 35% of federal, state, and local employees, roughly the same as in 1980. <coughs> over the years, they have won improved wages and benefits for their members, yet the leaders of many of these unions, particularly in Massachusetts, seem to be setting the stage for the same kind of deterioration we see in unions like the UAW. And I go on to say in here that it is, of course, been true for decades that the trade union movement of which I grew up in, <coughs> my father, Truth in Advertising, was vice president of the UAW and one of the leaders of the trade union movement in this country for many years, um, that in the old days, you used to have much of the right wing opposed to unions in so-called right-to-work states where the union shop is outlawed, where 
even if a majority of workers in the want to have a union, they can't. But today we're finding more and more forces aligned who are worried about the direction that organized labor has taken, particularly in the public sector, and have been calling for reforms, and we've had fairly sharp battles over that. Just this past week, uh, uh, we saw quite a battle in the Senate over a education reform bill that I hope Tom will talk a little bit about, and uh, perhaps we'll have some discussion about it. Uh, and the real question is, is whether, in fact, we can find a way for the trade unions, the public employee unions, for mayors, Scott Lang will be with us very shortly, Mayor of Bedford, to work together not only for the betterment of uh, union members, which of course is what unions should do, but find a way for unions and city officials, mayors and city managers, to work together so that they not only are working for their own members, but working for the good of the Commonwealth. That's what this is all about. So, our first speaker is indeed going to be Tom Gosnell. Tom was vice president of the Boston Teachers Union, right here in Boston, the BTU, and a member of its executive board. He served as an at-large member of the AFT Massachusetts Executive Board uh, from 1982 until he was elected secretary treasurer in 1988. Uh, he's also a former Latin teacher, so he'll be able to give this lecture indeed in Latin. <laughs> Um, it kite folk, hulias, 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 is what I remember from my Latin courses. Uh, he's now president of the Massachusetts uh, American Federation of Teachers, Federation of Teachers, uh, and as I said, one of the true leaders of the trade union movement in our state. Uh, following Tom, uh, we should have Scott Lang, who should be getting here very soon. Uh, he is the mayor of New Bedford. He was born in Oceanside, Long Island, New York, um, and for over 30 years uh, was a lawyer and often represented uh, unions like the Teamsters, the Longshoremen, the, uh, the Service Employees International Union. Uh, he's now been mayor of New Bedford, and in that capacity, he has been negotiating with the unions during these very difficult times in his city. He will tell a story about that. And finally, we have Bob McCursey with us. Bob is a professor emeritus of, Man uh, of management at MIT Sloan School. He's been there since 1980. Prior to his time at MIT, he served as the dean of the New York State School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University, and as a faculty member at the Graduate School of Business at the University of Chicago. Uh, one of the true leaders in this country in industrial relations. So without further ado, Tom. So, in Latina me obnuntium dabo, that says I shall give my lecture in Latin. Okay? First of all, I thank Barry uh, for inviting me here to speak with you. It's an absolute thrill. I do, think, I do things like this a lot, and I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm also glad that Barry said president of the American Federation of Teachers Massachusetts, so it's up there is not quite correct. Uh, we changed our name a few years ago to bring it in line with the American Federation of Teachers, which is our national organization. Now, whenever I stop, start any talk, I always like to say a few things about myself and my interests, so you'll see me as a human being, not just the head of an organization. And I do want you to know that one of the great passions of my life is the Red Sox. <laughs> so I want to tell you a little Red Sox story. You all remember Zero Four, correct? Yes? yes. Uh, are there any Yankee fans here? Well, I'm thrilled that there's one, because this is a Red Sox-Yankee story. So, we have finally reached the seventh game of that very famous American League Championship Series. And we're in an elementary school just outside of New York City. And the teacher walks in and says, I'm a Yankee fan. How many of you boys and girls are Yankee fans? Everyone raises 
his or her hand except for one little girl. And the teacher says, well, what are you? She said, I'm a Red Sox fan. And the teacher said, why are you a Red Sox fan? And she said, my dad's a Red Sox fan. My mom's a Red Sox fan. So I'm a Red Sox fan. And the teacher said, well, if your dad was stupid and your mom was stupid, what would you be? And she said, a Yankee fan. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope even the Yankee fan enjoyed that. <laughs> and I am a Latin teacher. I always consider myself a Latin teacher. I first taught at Brighton High School in the Boston Public Schools, and then I taught at Girls Latin School in the Boston Public Schools. That is now called uh, Boston Latin Academy. That is still very much part of my identity. And when people have asked me, why did you run for a union office? And I said, we needed more diversity in the leaders among teacher unions. I know of no Latin teacher that's the head of a union. <laughs> so by being a Latin teacher is very, very important. I also, I want you to know, because this is one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. I was the first guy in the Boston Public Schools to take a full year paternity leave. I truly believed that mothers have better relationship with their kids than dads do for a simple reason. They spend more time with them. So both my wife and I believe that one of us should be home for the first three years. So I was home for year number two. So I want you to see me in that dimension also because that is extremely important. But I have been a union official for 30 years, so I'm well experienced in the union movement. I've been secretary, treasurer, vice president, and now I am president. Uh, I, Barry uh, said, when I said, Barry, what should I talk about? And he said, well, talk about what's been going on. I said, I thought you told me to speak only 15 minutes rather than <laughs> two hours. Okay, so I will not speak uh, the two hours. But I, I really want to focus on two things. I want to respond to some criticisms that I think that have been made of teacher unions, and I will deal only with teacher unions. And I also want to talk about what I think are some very, very salient issues. As a union president, I of course am interested in the best salary, benefits, and working conditions that I can get for my members. That is very important. As a union president of teachers and other educational workers, I am deeply interested in the best education for the kids, particularly for poor kids. Uh, poor kids really get cheated in this society, and that is extremely important. I'll tell you a little story about my own son. After he got out of the local high school, my wife and I felt he should have another year of school before heading on to college. So lo and behold, he gets into Phillips Exeter. Phillips Exeter is the most extraordinary school I have ever seen in my life. My son was there, I really was there, and I learned more than he did. Quite frankly, what happens at Phillips Exeter doesn't happen in the very best public schools in Massachusetts. The kids in Weston, Wellesley, Winchester do not get what a kid at Phillips Exeter get, at Phillips Exeter get. And when I think of Peabody, Salem, Lowell, Lynn, Lawrence, Massachusetts, New Bedford, Fall River, Fitchburg, Springfield, it bothers me very very deeply. Now the current tuition at Exeter is, uh, of what it costs to educate a student there is $40,000. Roughly, roughly $28,000 is paid by the parents, $12,000 is paid out of the endowment that they have. This is as of several months ago. I don't know whether recession has any effect on that. We do not spend 
that kind of money on poor kids or any kid in Massachusetts. Massachusetts students are the tops in the nation on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Tops. Three years running. On the trends in international math and science tests, we are number one in the Western world. And we're very competitive with the Far Eastern countries. That's important fact. And I tie it into all the teachers who teach these kids that help our kids to become number, <coughs> number one work under collective bargaining agreements. Alabama and Mississippi, which have the lowest scores in the nation, work. There are no collective bargaining agreements in Alabama and Mississippi. So it's important that that point be made. But there are serious and significant issues that we have to address. Let me deal with just several of them. Teacher evaluations. Te teacher evaluations are dreadfully inadequate. They're not professional. A lot of the approach to it is, let's find out where there's an incompetent teacher and remove that incompetent teacher. Let me tell you quite frankly, we should not have incompetent teachers getting professional status. And one of the major problems there is, is that we don't have a detailed, in-depth system during the first three years that a teacher's in the classroom. That's the really critical time. After three years, you have professional status. The way things are set up now, we provide them neither with the support nor the amount and quality of evaluations that are necessary. Now, but that's a narrow view of evaluations. Evaluations should be able, should help every teacher become a better teacher. Focus on the ones that are allegedly incompetent. You forget all the ones that are competent and could become better. Even excellent teachers <coughs> can be better teachers. No one is perfect. But at least in this state, we do not have an evaluation system set up that can deal with that. But it's not just evaluation. One needs outstanding professional development throughout one's career. That does not happen nearly enough in Massachusetts. Mentoring programs. In Massachusetts, Mentoring programs are completely inadequate. Now, I will go even further and say, quite frankly, excellent teachers should be determining, well, let me, maybe determining is too strong a word. Excellent teachers should have a major say in whether a teacher gets professional status or not. In Toledo, Excellent teachers are part of the supervisory mechanism for teachers who do not have what they call tenure there. And they have a major say in whether a teacher should get what we call professional status. So, that is an idea that's well ahead of the time in Massachusetts. But if we truly believe that the teacher is the critical in-school person in the achievement of students, then it seems to me we should be drawing upon that talent and that knowledge and that skill and make indeed outstanding teachers, individuals who will have a major say in what is going on 
uh, in terms of getting professional status. I will deal with one other issue because I know I'm already over 15 minutes, right? You can deal with that. Okay. Uh, this is a smaller one, but it's very important. I think it captures what some of the conflict or some of the, uh, what I would call misperceptions of teacher unions. It was a front page article in the Herald yesterday. And it was also a major discussion between me and Speaker DeLeo in the House of Representatives. Exxon has a grant uh, that it gives here in Massachusetts for advanced placement work. Well, I love, personally, advanced placement. Uh, I went to a high school that stressed academic achievement enormously. So personally, I love advanced placement. And the program that was coming in to expand advanced placement a lot had wonderful things attached to it. There was one major issue, however, for me personally, quite frankly, and as president of the union, is that teachers teaching advanced placement were to get $100 for every kid who scored three on the advanced placement test. That was a major problem for me and for my union. And I could go on and on about the issues, but the issue is just one test determining whether someone should get additional pay for a student score. And it was hardly just the advanced placement teacher who considered, who contributed this kid's achievement. So, the speaker said to me, I heard that the unions are preventing this money from coming into the districts. I said, Mr. Speaker, I want the districts to get this money. It's important. And I told them what I told you. I said, but did you know, we also proposed that instead of giving the money to the teacher, that we get a, set up scholarship funds for the kids. Did you know? that if they didn't want to spend the money on the kids, why not even spend, why not spend the money on even better professional development for the teachers in this program? That is not well known. He said to me, I never knew that. So, I do think we're in a time, following uh, Barry's uh, uh, opening reading of his uh, op-ed piece in the Boston Globe, where indeed we, the unions, have to look at things, you know, very closely and very carefully. But I would say in closing what I said at the beginning, we are deeply committed to the best education for the kids, and I, in particular, am interested in poor kids. And let me add one other little point there. The package that the President and the Congress passed to bail out the banks is approximately $100 million more that every state in the nation spends on kindergarten through 12th grade education. That tells me something about our priorities, quite frankly, and I find it very disturbing. So we are interested in the best education for the kids, but again, realize just as important with that is we want the best salary and benefits for working conditions because quite frankly that's going to help in getting the best teachers. Thanks a lot.
do I walk to school or do I bring my lunch? <laughs> and uh, that's what I'm going to focus on today. I want to uh, use a code word that I think we all hear on a regular basis, and perhaps it's uh, associated with a different subject matter, but I think it's the code word that we need to focus on, and that's sustainability. Uh, we are all talking about uh, sustainability in everything that we uh, examine, but the fact of the matter is right now what, what I am uh, looking at is the sustainability of local governments and whether or not they will exist as we uh, have known them in our lifetimes and whether they will exist in the next uh, couple of generations uh, in some sort of a model other than a, uh, uh, a procurement type of uh, model. And what I mean by that is, is a uh, place where you will pay your taxes and we will procure services for you uh, by way of a uh, private sector type of uh, model. Uh, and I think that that is uh, something that we are moving towards if we don't begin to come become realistic about uh, the situation that we have ourselves in right now. Now, I didn't hear, God bless you, I didn't hear Tom's uh, presentation other than the last few moments, but I, I can tell you that more than likely, uh, I would agree with uh, uh, most everything that he said from the standpoint of we want individuals who have uh, living wages, who come to work with a, uh, a clear mission, who love their jobs, who are paid well, paid fairly. Um, and I think that uh, I want you to take everything I'm going to say under that context. I firmly believe that that's something that's extremely important for all of our employees, whether public or private. But I can tell you that we, we're in a situation right now where we are uh, not going to be able to continue to maintain local governments based on the model that exists today. And let me give you some, uh, some quick uh, vantage points of this. And I don't, I don't know if Barry in his introduction uh, covered this, but the fact of the matter is I, I've, I've been involved uh, for a, a long period of time in, uh, in labor law and employment law issues. In fact, when I started working in uh, the employment context, it was called labor law. And when I started teaching uh, in regarding uh, employment, it was called labor law. And then it now has become labor slash employment law. Things have changed dramatically. So let me go back and give you some examples. When I first started, uh, it was very, very clear that wages in the public sector uh, did not meet the wages in the private sector. And uh, for light work, they, they, were, uh, they were less. Uh, across the board, other than in very key, uh, key employee situations. In order to make up for that, uh, the public entities during bargaining uh, did things that made uh, an awful lot of sense, which was bargain out benefits, bargain out unfunded liabilities, that they would uh, hope to prop up the fact that the employee was not receiving uh, the same uh, type of pay as they would in the private sector. And uh, I can tell you that I helped build these uh, contracts and build these uh, bonds that exist today that are, that are taking away. And I'm going to give you some categories that, that I want you to think about. I know many of you are expert uh, in this area, but perhaps some of you might want to think about whether you have uh, these type of uh, benefits uh, available to you if you work in uh, private <coughs> employment and, quite frankly, some of you in public employment. First thing when we think of a job, is, uh, is wages, your basic wage, and are you paid fairly for the work that you do. And um, in the public sector, what we did to try and bolster wages was work on uh, not only your base wage, but also then also steps, which, uh, which came about automatically. Unfortunately, I'd like to tell you that steps were continued upon some sort of review based on merit, whatever, but by and large, they were, they were uh, based on anniversary dates. So if you started at step one, uh, if you started in grade uh, grade one and you worked up your way three, four, five steps, it may have occurred 